So we're going to continue looking at the wave particle duality subtopic of the light and atoms topic. And in this video, we are going to look at x-rays. Let's get into it. So to start off with, we are going to look at what are x-rays. And then we are going to look at how x-rays are produced. So x-rays are very high energy therefore very high frequency and short wavelength photons. They have such high energy they can pass through our body tissue, which leads to their main usage, which we'll talk about later, which is taking x-rays, which are images of our body. But if you want to think back to our electromagnetic spectrum, we have the visible light. As we get more high energy than the visible light, we go into the UV radiation, um, which we know causes sunburn. If you go beyond UV, you get to X-rays, which is the ones that can penetrate through our body to take images that I just talked about before. And if you go past X-rays, then you get into gamma, which you may have looked at gamma radiation that's formed from the decay of um, atoms, um, the, the nuclear decay of atoms last year. Um, so that's sort of where we are in the spectrum. So um, they... Um, X-ray photons can be produced when electrons that have been accelerated to higher speeds collide with a target. So I'm going to go through an X-ray tube, which is what's in an X-ray machine that produces X-rays. But just before that, if we look at this diagram down the bottom here, we have got this electron, and this electron is going to be fired at, and W stands for tungsten. I'll talk about the tungsten target in a sec, um, but W is the symbol for tungsten. And when we fire an electron at very high speeds at an atom, like tungsten, as it, it can basically, because of its high speeds, it can interact um, very closely with the nucleus of the tungsten. And as it does that, it will cause it to basically accelerate. So that might be to slow down or that might be to change path or, or some other way affect its trajectory. It, because of its high speed, it won't just be repelled by the electron cloud around the outside. It will actually fire inside that. And as it fires inside that and it loses its energy, some or all of that energy will be converted to an X-ray photon. Now, the reality is, I think I say here, about 99% of it is actually just converted to heat. It's only about 1% that gets converted to X-rays. And we'll talk about what those x-rays look like a little bit more in the next slide. But as you fire an electron at an atom, as it interacts with that the uh, well, interacts with um, near the nucleus of the atom, um, it basically will lose energy. Conservation says that energy has to go somewhere. It will be transferred to a high energy photon, which is an x-ray. Remember, all electromagnetic radiation is caused by the acceleration of a charged particle. Think back to our antenna in the, um, in the electromagnetic waves um, subtopic when we talked about that earlier. So this is basically just um, a really large acceleration of an atom, um, sorry, a really large acceleration of a charged particle, an electron, will cause a really high energy photon, um, an X-ray. So in practice, how do we achieve that? We use an X-ray tube, which looks a little bit like this. This is a bit of a Simple representation, but it's, it's pretty realistic to what they look like. Um, I think there is a photo in one in the workbook that you'll see that, that looks a bit like this if you want to have a look. Now, let's start here. Firstly, we have a low voltage power supply. And this low voltage power supply uh, basically heats up this filament here, which is just like a conventional light bulb. So this is the cathode filament acts as a source of electrons. So when you heat it up, the electrons are near the surface, they can easily be pulled off. This is very similar to what happens with the um, cathode ray tube, which we use to look at the motion of electrons in a electric and a magnetic field earlier in the year. Um, we had that low voltage supply on our power, low voltage source on our power supply, and we use that to heat up the filament. Now, between that filament and this part here, which is called the anode, or I prefer the target, we apply our very high voltage. So this goes around to here, this goes to here. We apply a very high voltage, and that causes any electrons that 
well, the electrons it causes at the surface here to be accelerated at high speed towards the target just there. Now, a couple of things about this target or this anode. Um, it's normally made of solid copper with a little tungsten insert. So that B is supposed to show the tungsten insert and it sits in copper. Tungsten is used due to its very high melting point and hardness. So it basically won't be degraded too quickly by these continual bombardment, bombardment with high energy electrons. And copper is used to include it because it's an electric, excellent electrical conductor. And this obviously needs to be hooked up to a high voltage, but it's also a good heat conductor. So it conducts the heat away. That heat gets conducted down this copper um, piece of copper and we have these cooling fins here which just have a high surface area and help to cool down the anode because we get lots of heat produced. Um, this needs to be all enclosed within a vacuum. If there was other particles in here then the electrons would collide with those and they wouldn't make it to the target. Um, and finally, um, well when the electrons strike the target most of their energy is converted to heat. I mentioned this before a couple of times already. Um, that's why we need to be able to conduct the heat away and a small amount like down here gets released as x-ray photons. So I'm going to talk um, in a couple of slides time about how we set this up and operate it in more detail but that gives you an overview of what x-rays are, how they are produced and what an x-ray tube that they are produced in looks like and how it works. So hopefully now you can describe the purpose of the following features of a simple x-ray tube. The filament, source of electrons, the target, um, to be the spot where we generate x-rays, the high voltage supply to accelerate the electrons, the evacuated tube so we don't get collisions inside so they lose energy, and the cooling fins to cool the target. Let's keep going. So now let's look at the spectrum of the x-rays that are produced in, a, in an x-ray tube. And by spectrum, we just mean how many, so the intensity, which is just a measure of how many different photons of different frequencies are produced in the, um, the x-ray tube. Um, what we see is this sort of distribution or this sort of shape with the peaks here. And basically there are three main features of that that you need to be able to describe. Um, so not really so much explain here, just describe. The first one is that you get basically a continuous range of frequencies. So this isn't like, um, say, line um, emission spectrum, which I think we've touched on before, but we'll talk more about emission spectrum before, where you just see individual frequencies of light produced you see a continuous range of spectra, um, frequencies produced up to a maximum, which we'll talk about in a minute. The next thing I'll mention, it's not the next thing that they list, but the next thing I'll mention is that you see some high intensity peaks at particular frequencies. And these um, or known as characteristic x-rays, but these, um, the, the positioning of these targets will generally depend on your target material. Um, so you don't need to know what causes these. It's basically to do with certain preferred energy levels in those atoms, which probably won't come as a surprise. But all you need to do is describe that you would see these high intensity peaks usually as you get towards F max in the spectrum. And the third thing, which we will look at in a little bit more detail, is you need to... Um, recognize, oops, that's a rubber, not a pen, that there is, you will see x-rays up to a maximum frequency. So you won't have some really, really, really high energy, um, well, high frequency and therefore high energy photons past the point. There is this spot where you basically get a maximum amount of energy in your photons. So um, what causes that? Well, the maximum frequency occurs at the point where basically all the energy, oops, all the energy of 
electron is converted to the photon. So this is the derivation that you need to do, which it talks about just below. So the energy of the electron can be given to us from, um, so for the electron, that's given to us by the work done equals Q delta V. And the maximum energy for the photon would be E equals HF. So basically when W equals E, that means that Q delta V equals HF. And here, if you like, I haven't set this out really well. Let's just do a line here and do a second column. And I'll draw, oops, that's not what I wanted. I'll just draw my iPod has a bit of a mind of its own at the moment. And I'm recording in the shed today, so you might be able to hear the door banging, sorry. Um, so the um, Q, Q equals the E, that's the charge on an electron. And obviously, we're dealing with the point where all of that energy is transferred. So F equals F max. So that means when we rearrange what's over there, we get well, let's not even rearrange it first. We get E delta V equals H F max. Oops, spelled that wrong. H F max. And if we rearrange, F max will be equal to E delta V on H. Sorry, I've done that a little bit messy, but hopefully that makes sense. So now, hopefully, you can sketch a graph of the spectrum of the x-rays, show the three main features of the spectrum, continuous high energy peaks, F max. You can explain why a continuous range of frequencies and the maximum, oh, you can explain the continuous range of frequencies and the maximum frequency in the spectrum. So I've just explained the maximum here. Maybe I haven't explained the continuous. The continuous is the fact that depending on how closely an electron interacts with the nucleus of the target will be how much energy it loses, therefore how much gets converted to the X-ray photon. So ones here with a lower frequency, lower energy, just don't lose as much energy but they can't lose any more energy than the maximum energy that the electron has. You can derive that formula there, like I've done at the pro bottom, and hopefully everyone who's doing Year 12 physics can now fairly easily work with a problem like that and solve problems with that. So that is the spectrum of the X-ray. Let's, um, let's look at, if you like, so taking x-ray images now and what's involved in that. So we're going to do a bit of a crash course in being an x-ray technician. Now, the bad news is if you want to become an x-ray technician, you're probably going to need to get an ATAR of well of an excess of 95 and go to university for three or four years and probably four years, I think, and learn how to do it. But I reckon we can explain what you sort of need to do in fairly simple terms as well. So firstly... Um, when x-rays go through our body, they will be, um, th there'll be the attenuation or they'll be attenuated. Um, now, attenuation is basically the, the decrease in the x-rays passing through your body because they are either absorbed by your flesh or your bones or they are scattered sideways. So when you shine them through and you have some sort of film behind them, the film won't pick them up because your bones or your flesh 
will absorb some of those. So just that, I think absorption is a better word and it's not wrong, but basically the scattering and absorption combined are called the attenuation. And that's why we can see um, structures inside our body because they have absorbed some of the x-rays, not passed through, and that leaves that image. Now there's three factors that affect the attenuation of x-rays in your body. That is the density of the tissue. So the greater the density, the greater the attenuation. So things like bones have a greater density than muscles. So they attenuate x-rays more and show up. Also some tumors tend to be more dense than the surrounding tissues. So tumors will often also show up in an x-ray. The thickness of the tissue, the thicker the tissue, the greater the attenuation. So you would get more attenuation if you tried to take a x-ray through your thigh than you would say through your wrist, which is much thinner than your thigh. And finally, and um, I've got some x-rays here. This is of a Liz Frank injury to a foot, which I know it's a reasonably common uh, injury. Well, not reasonably common, but not uncommon um, injury in windsurfing, um, hence why it's the one I thought about when I looked at it. And that is the greater the number, the greater the atomic number of the elements making up the tissue, the greater the attenuation. So firstly, bones contain a lot of calcium. Calcium is element number 20, whereas most of the um, tissue is made basically of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, which is carbon is six, oxygen is eight, uh, hydrogen is one, so calcium will attenuate the x-rays better and show up. But also things like screws that are made of metals, um, and they might be made of things like, you know, titanium or, um, I'm just trying to think, yeah, other, um, maybe even things like stainless steel, which is made of iron, they would all have um, greater atomic number, so they would attenuate, and that's why they tend to show up really clearly in the x-rays as well. So, you want to take an x-ray. The first thing we need to know about is the penetrating power, or sometimes referred to as the hardness of the x-rays. And that's related to the energy of the x-rays. The energy of the x-rays is proportional to the frequency, because E equals HF, and that is controlled by the tube potential. So whatever voltage we have that high voltage supply on will determine the maximum frequency. I went through that derivation in the previous slide. So if we have thick or dense tissue, that requires a greater penetrating power, therefore a greater tube potential. So again, we'd probably need to use a higher voltage on the high voltage supply to increase the penetrating power of the x-rays if we were x-raying our thigh as, composed, as opposed to our wrist. The other thing, like when we take a, take a photograph we need to control, is the intensity of the x-rays. Generally, we want to get nice, clear images when we take x-rays. If we want to get nice, clear images, we need to take them over quite short times. If you ever try and take a photo with what we call a long exposure time, things will move in that photo, they will be blurry, it will be harder to make stuff, make out um, you know, detail within that photo. Well, it's the same with an x-ray. We want to get generally as higher intensity x-rays as we can without risking causing harmful side effects from the x-rays um, because they are high energy. You know, in an extreme case, you know, you could get something like a burn or something like that. But yeah, the greater the intensity of the x-rays, the less exposure time required. Um, the intensity of the x-rays can be increased by increasing the filament current. So if we increase that current that sort of lights up the filament, um, if we think back to the cathode ray tube, if that's hotter, there will be more electrons available there, there will be more electrons fired across to the target, therefore there will be a greater intensity of x-rays. This will cause an increase in the tube current, the current between the anode and the cathode, so that's just the number of electrons flowing. Lower exposure times are beneficial as it reduces the chances of a patient moving during x-ray and blurring occurring. A bit of poetry to end that line. So hopefully that's sort of just what I've said already. I've repeated myself a bit as I've said what's written out. But if you are an x-ray technician controlling that um, x-ray machine, the two main things that you would be varying would be the voltage 
the tube potential, so the voltage to the tube, that will change the energy of the X-rays, and the filament current will it will change the number or the intensity of X-rays, um, so that you can get a clearer image quicker. That's it for X-rays.